Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. For this week's review, I'm going to reach back in my memory banks for a series I first read about five years ago. Like my previous subject, R.F. Kuang's Babel, it has a political spin, but it's a rather different one. This series is a reboot of sorts. It's very much like Robert Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress in that it involves a war between the Earth and a moon colony. Though this time it is not a penal colony. I am talking about the Aristellus series by Travis J.I. Corcoran, which has two main books, Powers of the Earth and Causes of Separation. Ideological fiction can be a problem, especially if it's for a fringe groups such as libertarians. Ayn Rand is a good example. <laughs> her ideas are interesting, but her writing is mediocre at best. I mean, you have the heroic passages with pe which people like, but at the same time, you have all these pages and pages of didactic preaching, which can get really boring. <laughs> like there's got this many, many page long speech by John Galt at the end of Atlas Shrugged. So, though this is an influential book, I wouldn't give it a very high rating. I mean, I'd give it three out of five gears at best. It was partly due to the low quality, even of uh, well-known books like this, of message fiction that made me want to get into writing seriously. Nonetheless, regarding message fiction, I don't have to agree with something to like it. If it's well done, if it's not too one-sided, and uh, kind of spiteful, like a particular recent book that I reviewed, um, I can still enjoy it. I can still relate to it. I can still see the person's point. At the same time, there have been a number of books I've agreed with that I have strongly disliked. And I'm not talking about Rands, which just have flaws. But in any case, you have to have a good balance of message versus action versus character. And you have to have well-rounded characters that do things that are realistic in the standpoint so people can find it believable. So I'm going to judge these two books, Corcoran's books, on the merits of the story, of the plot, of the characters, and his writing style, rather than his message, although the message is part of it. Full disclosure, I have encountered Travis online. I was a fellow member of an online group for libertarian sci-fi writers. He is an interesting character. <laughs> he is into self-sufficient living. He's in New Hampshire in the rural area. And he got himself elected the New Hampshire State House. At the same time, he's made some pretty outrageous statements about pr particular political topics that have gotten him to hot water at some times. And I can't say I agree with it all. But this isn't, isn't about whether I agree with him or not. I mean, I'm not one of those people that has to, you know, agree with everything. But I like him because he's a maverick who, who says what he thinks. Now, I'm no longer in this particular online group, mainly because it cost a subscription fee and it had kind of fallen into quiescence. There was nobody posting anything. And so I thought, what's the use? At the same time, I'm not really uh, associated with the libertarian movement anymore either partly because the party has become quite irrelevant and uh, because a lot of them I thought were kind of sellouts to the establishment. At the same time, I'm not really on the hardcore anarchist uh, bent either that a lot of them are. So I can't really relate to that that well. Still, I am open-minded. I mean, this is definitely an anarchist type sci-fi book, but... If it's well written, it is worth reading. So we're going to see how it measures up. Now, both of these titles of both books are taken from the U.S. Declaration of Independence from the preamble. In the past, everybody would have known this to some degree. Now, I doubt that they even teach it anymore because it's, it's those evil white men from our past. <laughs> some of them own slaves. Oh, my God. But, you know, it is something. It is part of our past, and we should know it. It's the part that starts, when in the course of human events, 
it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth there's the first title and it goes on to say that they have to declare the causes which impel them to the separation which gives us the second title the series is called Aristillus because much of it takes place in a location that we can all see at night with a decent telescope, the lunar crater Aristillus. This is a permanently prominent crater. It's named after an ancient Greek astronomer. It's 55 kilometers in diameter, pretty circular. It's got a 900 meter ridge around it completely. You know, it's an impact crater. And so it seemed like a pretty cool place for a lunar colony. These two books were published in 2018 from Morlock Publishing, which is Travis's own, own uh, company. And they also have audiobook versions by Podium Audio. And because of, it was a successful crowdfunding project, these novels, he was able to afford to pay a professional narrator. And, and thus, the two audiobooks are quite good. It's by a guy named Sean Renette. I have not run into him before, but his voice is a little bit, I wouldn't say gravelly, but it's it's got a, a, a tone to it. I mean, that makes me think of the kind of the maverick, uh, perhaps veteran type of guy that would have been the protagonist of this book. Now, this is, as I said, somewhat like uh, Heinlein's Moon is a Harsh Mistress, but in that case, the moon was a penal colony, and they put all these prisoners up there to basically run the lunar minor op operations, and they were basically being exploited, kind of like prisoners are exploited these days. <laughs> but, you know, that was kind of un unrealistic in the idea that the government, any government, would go to all that expense to put somebody up there that they couldn't necessarily trust, you know what I mean? Now, in this case, it's more like the Gulf's Gulch idea from Atlas Shrugged, in which a group of maverick billionaires and visionaries uh, develop this anti-gravity drive, and they this gives them a way to cheaply and clandestinely do this lunar colony. And it reminds me a little bit of Elon Musk. You know, these are people who are willing to you know, really make a commitment to their beliefs. And so here in Aristillus, they build an underground city. And it's a diverse society of rebels and malcontents and refugees and so on that becomes quite prosperous. Now, I'll get into the main characters in a little bit. As far as the Earth, from the 10 years when the colony was first started to when the action actually starts in the book, the earth has gotten worse and worse. The situation has gone downhill. There is a multi-decade depression due to all the overregulation and the highly planned economies of the world's countries, especially the United States. One of the worst causes is all these green regulations, you know, like we're like we're saying. Um, the Agenda 2030 and so on, smart cities and all that garbage, where they are supposedly protecting us from the evil carbon dioxide. But main, mainly it's just, you know, making everybody poor and uh, restricting movements and so on. Now, somehow these colonists evade detection early on, but when the U.S. government becomes aware of them, they think, oh, here's a golden goose that we can kill and plunder uh, because we're nearly bankrupt. <laughs> and how dare they? How dare they go out without permission and uh, do this and have all these free economies? It makes us look bad. Now, in real life, you got to know that we actually have to ask permission to leave the Earth. Even if we had the money, you know, you're supposed to have the permission of the FAA and NASA and so on if you want to have a space launch. Now, that is if you're an American citizen, American country, and I assume that there are probably other restrictions in, from other nations. So seriously, you have to ask permission to leave. <laughs> now in the first book, the colonists just barely managed to survive this first invasion force from Earth, which is 
you know, from conventional rockets and from subversion, from sending, from trying to capture their smuggling ships that go back and forth and from uh, planting, you know, people in, in the lunar colonies to, to subvert them, to do sabotage and so on. In the second book, however, the Earthers discover how to do the anti-gravity drive, so it's uh, even worse, They even bigger challenge, because now they can invade in earnest. These two books, though they were both published in 2018, they won the Prometheus Award for freedom-focused science fiction 2018 and 2019. So did pretty well in the libertarian sci-fi community. The characters are a really big part of this book, which is a good thing. A lot of times ideological fiction doesn't have good characters, and I think this one does have some pretty good characters. The main protagonist is a renegade CEO and gun nut known as Mike Martin, and he has a company called Morlock Engineering. Morlock because he's making tunnels, like the uh, Morlocks in the HGOL's novel. He came up with the idea of leaving the Earth due to all this persecution. He was actually tried and convicted, or I think he fled before the trial, but they were having all these show trials of all these CEOs who were blamed for the bad economy, were blamed for the environmental devastation of all these things that the governments were actually responsible for. Now, on the moon colony, he is a bit of a celebrity because he's the founder, or one of the main founders, and he's wealthy, but he doesn't like this attention. He doesn't want to be a leader. He doesn't want to tell people what to do. He just wants to do his job and to, you know, build new environments. He's making tunnels and making new neighborhoods and new factories and all, and he likes that kind of productive work. Uh, but, you know, some people are looking for leadership. There is no government in this colony. It's just, it's kind of like Sun City in Arizona. It has no, it has no city government. And so it's all informal. It's all uh, company run, let's say. There's these different security companies that enforce the, you know, I guess you would call it natural law, like don't steal, don't kill, you know, don't, don't bother people, that kind of thing. And... And so they managed to get along without having a formal government. At the same time, Mike has been warning people for several years that he thinks an invasion from the Earth is imminent because there's no way that they can continue, continue on their course without wanting to plunder the wealthy moon colony. And everybody's saying, no, no, that's too much trouble. They're not going to bother. They're going to leave us alone. But are they? That's the question. And of course, he turns out to be right. There are a lot of other great characters. One is his girlfriend, Darcy, and she's very understanding because he's such a nerd, you know, not very demonstrative, uh, doesn't want to commit, you know, uh, hesitant to ask her to marry him and all that stuff. And he's got a, a good friend named Javier, who is kind of the sensible one. He's always kind of trying to uh, keep his crazy ideas down, all these business associates. And then there he has uh, rivals and and uh, even enemies on the moon, including other companies that are trying to cheat him, that are trying to uh, basically torpedo his business, which is successful because he's competent and they're not, <laughs> that sort of thing. There are other, other uh, of the characters are Earth politicians who are pretty much uniformly bad. <laughs> especially the President of the United States, who is a woman named Johnson, who was a TV talk show host. And I'm not sure who this is supposed to be, but she is is very, very venal and very unintelligent. <laughs> she's, she's like power hungry, and she doesn't really comprehend why the economy is going down the tubes and why the U.S. is bankrupt. It's all their fault, that sort of thing. So there's a number of those. There's there's um, military leaders who are more nuanced characters because most of them have some common sense and understand that, you know, maybe these moon people have have reasons for doing what they're doing. Uh, as far as the moon people, I also like the dogs. <laughs> yes, they have dogs as characters because there were on the Earth there were these 
dogs that were genetic experiments, uplifting as we call it in sci-fi, they were engineered to be as smart as people. In fact, these dogs are smarter than the average people. And when the U.S. government decided this was illegal tech, they were going to st destroy all these dogs, even though they're like they're like people. It's, it would be murder. But uh, this one a military guy named John, this veteran, rescues them, takes them to the moon, along with this smart AI that was running the project, who also becomes a character in the book. The AI is named Gamma. Anyway, these dogs are a lot of fun. They can talk <laughs> and they can argue and they play video games and they go, they're go. they going on a hike on the far side in these dog-made spacesuits <laughs> with their friend John. And, uh, they, and they are, they all have these crazy personalities like they and they're called names are Blue, Duncan, Rex, Max, very dog-like names. Uh, there are a lot of subplots involving Mike's trials and tribulations as a business owner. This one rich kid is, is reckless while hiking on the moon's surface and dies uh, from his recklessness. And it turns out that Mike has a stake in the spacesuit rental company. <laughs> so he's getting sued because he's got the deep pockets. And he's got these business rivals. And I think I already said this. They're, they're trying to undermine him, literally, <laughs> because they're all tunneling, you know. And there's all these people that need more and more space as, as things go on. Now, suddenly the communication satellites are out. This is because the Earth has decided that they're going to invade. And then in planning for their invasion, they zap these satellites. They also start trying to capture the smuggling ships that go back and forth between the Earth and the Moon. One is Darcy's ship, which is called the Wookiee. Great name. And so they've got all this conflict. The dogs help figure out what has happened with the satellites because they are so brilliant. And the AI, Gamma, also becomes a, an important character, uh, much like the AI character Mike in the Heinlein book. Corcoran has published three other Aristillus-related works. Uh, one is called Staking a Claim, which is a prequel and there's a short story called The Team. And there's finally a recent one called Aristotle's Engineering Club, which is a YA sequel. Haven't read any of these yet, but I probably will. Pros and cons. Pros, I love the characters, especially the heroic ones. I know the um, government characters are not as well-rounded, but it's kind of fun to hate these people. So I like that too. There's a lot of action and great tech, you know, uh, tech ideas. The dogs are my favorite part. And the AI is a pretty cool character as well. He's a little bit more mysterious. I love the humor. Part of it is the dogs and their antics. Uh, part of it is also poking fun at the ultra PC Earth Society. One example in point is there's a captain a, in the Army Rangers who is leading an assault on one of these smuggling boats that is taking off from the South Pacific in the middle of the night. And uh, he has this platoon that's full of handicapped people. <laughs> <You see? laughs> they're, in, they're in walkers and wheelchairs and so on because you have to be equal, right? You have to have, 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 to have handi handicapped people in the infantry. <laughs> So this makes things go pretty badly for him. <laughs> and it's it's a little extreme, but it's almost believable considering what they've done to the military in the past few years. The tech is mostly realistic. I mean, it's mostly believable, let's say, in in light of what where we currently are and where we will be in 30 years. However, anti-gravity is probably the biggest, most far-fetched one of the bunch. It's Hard to believe how they could do that, although, you know, people are researching that, and it would be pretty awesome if we could get it. The intelligent AI, in particular, is, is rather conceivable, considering the direction we've been going. There are a few cons, of course, as there always are. It's, it's kind of tropish. A lot of these libertarian books, in particular, have these 2D villains. As I already noted, unfortunately, 2D villains also have a bad effect in that 
it's not as interesting when they're just kind of venal and stupid, <laughs> as a lot of these are. Uh, and there's also some unrealistic aspects to this book. The most particular is the biggest plot hole is the fact that they were able to do this lunar colony incognito as it was. Even though they are taking off with a technology that isn't, you know, isn't uh, giving off a lot of heat, they're doing it in the middle of the night without lights, even so I think that the satellites would see these things. And so that's a big plot hole. Another plot hole is that we have all these refugees coming in to the moon and um, and they get along pretty well. And there doesn't seem to be very much crime among the lower classes, even with all these different ethnic groups who in reality in on the earth, different groups don't seem to get along very well. Most of the crime seems to be white collar crime, you know, like you would have on a uh, TV show uh, done by Hollywood liberals, <laughs> where well, the poor people are just, uh, they're all law-abiding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, you know, so there's that. There Again, there's the reliance or luck and government stupidity to not detect them until they've already well-established. So, nonetheless, I think you can suspend disbelief and root for these guys no matter what. There's a lot of computer terms in this book that are kind of dated, even after five years. Like there's a lot about augmented reality, which I haven't seen much about that recently. It's kind of fallen off the radar in only five years. And uh, there's a lot of hacker and uh, gamer terms like pwned. I'm not sure, do people use the term pwn anymore? I don't know. Predictions are almost too optimistic. I mean, things have really slid way worse than Corcoran was predicting, and you can't blame him for that, but as far as realism, oh my God, it seems things are sliding into complete chaos and uh, disaster way earlier <laughs> than it should have been as far as a rating. I would give it 4.5 out of 5 gears. I still really enjoyed it. I still think it's really fun. As long as you're not complete doctrinaire progressive, you will probably enjoy this if you have any sympathy whatsoever you know, towards American entrepreneurial spirit uh, and the pioneer spirit. Uh, if, you just, if you don't hate all white people, <laughs> for example, you'll like it. And at the same time, it's a very diverse book, so it's not like he's in any way implying that everybody can't take part because all these different groups do take part in this lunar colony. So I would think a lot of people will really, really enjoy this, especially if you like hard sci-fi adventure. So this has been my review of the Aristellus series by Travis J.I. Corcoran. Now note the initials because there are more than one Travis Corcoran online. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below and give me more suggestions. Please like and subscribe because this will help us get out the good steampunk word. And now previews of coming attractions. And I have been listening. I've been reading your comments. So I am going to do another one on history. This one will be Napoleon in Fact and Fiction. It just took me a while to get through this really long biography <laughs> and the really long movie. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed learning about that. So look forward to that one. The next one is a, another steampunk series that actually came out a few years ago, but I was unaware of it. It's called Steam Cap. A C A P P, which is an acronym that is much in the tradition of the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, only this is an American group. And so look forward to that review as well. For now, this is Steampunk Test Power saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Test Power channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. <laughs>